I'm Billy Vance. Welcome to Bits and Bytes 2, our final program, which is about... Pictures. I've got a presentation to do for my board of directors. How do you like my kite? You did that? Well, actually, I found it in the library of clip art to go along with that hot air balloon we used before. But I don't know about these streamers. Mm. Whoops. You know, you could zoom in and edit it pixel by pixel. All right. You zoom in. This is great for touching up a picture. Not exactly Leonardo, but I've seen worse. Well, that's the good thing about this type of program. Okay, what's the bad thing? Well, suppose you wanted to blow up one of your little balloons at the bottom of the screen. All right. Oh, I see. Hmm. When the pixels get big, they make the curved line all jagged. Staircasing? Or aliasing, as they say in the trade. What you're using here is called a paint program. Try using the other main type of graphic software, a draw program. What's the difference? Oh, well, you'll see. There's a draw program that comes built in with the latest version of Word for Windows. Microsoft Draw. So I'll make another little circle. Get the circle tool. And the magnifying glass to zoom in. And this one is perfectly smooth. Why is that? Is it just because this is a draw program and this is a paint program? That's right. I don't get it. They're both built out of pixels, aren't they? Uh-huh. So why are the results so different when you blow up the picture? Because the way draw programs handle pixels is quite different from the way paint programs handle them. Computer graphics programs are like the pointillist painter Georges Seurat. They build pictures out of tiny blobs or points of color. Computer people refer to these as pixels. But not all graphics programs are created equal. They fall into two classes, as if Georges Seurat had been cloned into two very different kinds of artists. The first electronic Seurat, nicknamed Bitmap by his friends, is a paint program, a myopic plotter who plops down his pixels one at a time with no idea what he's creating. He doesn't know a hat from a handsaw. All he knows is how to fill in the dots on a grid or the bits on a map, as they say in these parts. Contrast poor old bitmap with his much more enlightened twin, Vector, who is a draw program. Vector also works with pixels, but has a distinctly Cartesian frame of mind and plots his creations in geometric terms. He knows exactly what a hat is. In this case, a semicircle resting on a curved line, and he builds it up of directional lines of pixels, known locally as vectors. Now, see what happens if we ask the two Surats to double the size of their hats. Bitmap not only increases the size of his hat, but he also blindly doubles the size of each block of pixels, producing a very lumpy piece of headgear indeed. Vector, on the other hand, who is much more object-oriented, recalls the coordinates of his geometric hat, multiplies them by two, and redraws the hat accordingly. So the contours of his confection remain smooth. Whether or not connoisseurs of art will approve of either version is another matter altogether. So, paint programs create bitmapped graphics pixel by pixel whereas draw programs create them line by line with vector graphics. Also known as object-oriented graphics. Which can give you an object in any scale? That's right, including text, of course. Any font that you have, times Roman or Helvetica or whatever, could be scaled up or down in that way. Oh, so that's what scalable fonts are. You got it. And this is exactly how a postscript printer works. A uh, what? A postscript printer is any kind of printer that incorporates the postscript language. Uh, the postscript language was created a number of years ago by Adobe Systems. It uses vectors to describe a page. They license the technology to a number of printer manufacturers, and a computer uses the postscript language, interprets the page, and sends that code, that mathematical description of a page, to the printer which then interprets the code and sends it out as a, a final printed page. 
Uh, initially, it was just used for printers, and bitmap, bitmaps were still used on screen. So consequently, you may get a fine printed result, but on the screen, you got a mishmash, and it was very difficult for designers or anyone else who needed to really see what the printed page was going to look like to do any kind of serious work. So Adobe created something called Type Manager, which in interprets the postscript language and gives you a postscript interpretation of the characters on the screen as well. With Adobe Type Manager, you can show on the screen type at any point size and it will always remain crisp and clear. For example, here we have hello at a relatively small point size, but we can enlarge that and it will still remain crisp on the screen. This is the postscript code for the page we just saw. It describes every portion of the page, whether there's characters on the page or not. There's over 2,000 lines of code in a single 8 and a half, 11 standard page. There are thousands of postscript fonts available, and they can be displayed and printed at an infinite variety of sizes, from one point up to thousands of points in size. They can also be displayed in Roman face, italic, bold, or combinations, bold, italic. Uh, more recently, a number of companies created TrueType, which combines the capabilities of PostScript and Type Manager. Can I do a vector graphics version of my presentation? Oh, sure. Let's suppose you've been working in Microsoft Draw all along rather than Windows Paintbrush. Okay. Which means that I got the clip art balloon and kite from vector graphics files? Exactly. So now I can scale them up or down? Turn them inside out if you like. Just click on the kite, for instance. Those little black squares are your control handles. Drag on any of them to change the shape of the kite. I can squish it and squash it however I like. You could also rotate it or flip it. Click on draw and then rotate flip. Rotate. This is fun. Now I'll just print out the kite. That's pretty good. Maybe I should invest in a color printer. Mm, but then again, I'm no artist, and this is taking forever to do. I'm still only on page one. Well, there are shortcuts, ready-made business presentation programs. Try Freelance Graphics. Freelance Graphics for Windows. Smart Master Sets are pre-designed presentation formats. They give you a choice of 60 different formats altogether. Circle. Motion, Mountain. Type presentation title. Type subtitle. On to the next page. You've got nine different page layouts. Within each of the 60 Smart Master sets, that's 9 times 60, 540 total. I'll just do one column bullet for now. Great regional sales. Kites outsell balloons. Let's imagine you've finished your presentation and you want to preview it. Try the page sorter icon. The one on the right with four little pages. Now if I want to change the order, say, move the graph. Just drag it where you want it to go. Oh, this is too easy. You can also get all the colors of the rainbow. Just click on style and choose palette. Blue, green. Dark blue. Green, and back to mountain. How many colors can I get all together? Or does that depend on your monitor? 
No, no. It, it isn't the monitor that decides the number of colors. It's a special circuit board inside the computer called a video graphics array. A VGA card? That's right. A standard VGA card can give you a basic display of 16 colors at a resolution of 640 by 480 pixels. If I remember those specs correctly, I've got Super VGA, haven't I? That's right. Giving you up to 256 colors at a resolution of 800 by 600 pixels. But didn't it say in the specs that my screen was 1024 by 768? Well, you can set your screen resolution that high, but it makes everything look smaller. So for clarity, you usually set it at 800 by 600. I can't wait to show this to my board of directors. Okay. Click on View and Screen Show. Oh, it runs a slideshow of my presentation right from my computer. Could I make actual slides from this? Well, there are service bureaus that'll do that for you. Just send them your file. Or modem it. Aha, or modem it. Better still. With the service bureau, you'd get real photographic quality color slides with millions of different colors. Now, if I had a full color printer, could I turn out a photographic quality Technicolor brochure of my presentation? Well, your average printer itself couldn't do that. But it could generate the instructions telling an image-setting machine how to do it. The big uh, change in this business uh, with regards specifically to Macintosh and our own personal experiences, some years ago, prior to me having these, a client would come in wishing to design a flyer or a brochure and let's pick the local flower shop. She wanted a beautiful flyer done. The first job, I, the first thing I'd do then would be to call on our artist to come in who would sit with me and the client. Uh, the artist would get the idea of what she was trying to do. He would then create a, a, a drawing and she would approve or make, give some suggestions whereupon she would leave we would go back in there, and he would sit down now, and he'd, re he'd go to our typesetter and say, this is what I need in type. He'd go to our cameraman and say, shoot me this, and get me a stat. All very complicated, requiring quite a bit of machinery. What Macintosh specifically has done now is that uh, one person does everything. Now, the paradox is, Getting a person with all those skills to sit in front of the, the Macintosh to complete the job. But uh, we're lucky enough here to, to have such people. This is all done now by the one person that is the designer, the typesetter, and the photographer, if you will. We just rescale the picture, change type, style perhaps, or even layout. It could all be done very, very quickly, directly on the screen. And when I say quickly, we're talking here in seconds, not talking uh, hours to, re uh, to change the layout as the old way was. It's done instantly on the screen. Okay, our printer is just 300 DPI, black and white. It's mainly just used for approving. So what you're looking at here is what the customer would see, and they'd approve it the layout of it only and the spelling. And if it's all right to them, then we'd back it up in a disk and send it out to a service bureau where it would be printed out high resolution color output. So they can either proof from the page itself or look at the screen. Seven years ago, we did a 720 page job for a very large automotive company here in Toronto. Uh, the type bill using our old computer, old being 1981, uh, was $38,000 and took five weeks to produce. We have since did, done that same job, and it was $9,000 and uh, five days. So I could have this printed as a coffee table brochure or have slides made from it. Or overhead projector transparencies. Or show it directly from my computer. You could also consider making your presentation even more impressive by bringing in pictures from any source, uh, clip art, photographs. Photos of my management team, maybe. Or <clears throat> perhaps a picture of your star consultant. Now, you could just paste it into your document <clears throat> by scanning it in, Victoria. Thank you.
Well, it looks like a little photocopying machine. Except that instead of merely copying a picture, it digitizes it into a bit-mapped graphic. And then I could rearrange your face. Oh, just kidding. Well, if you really want to take liberties with my image, try the CorelDRAW graphics package. CorelDRAW is also a combination draw and paint program. So, I put the photograph in the scanner and... And hit enter. Now, this is amazing. I think I'll change the color of your shirt. Hmm. 256 colors. I think I'll give you a blue shirt. Yes, I like that better. Uh, but now the setting looks bland. Okay, click on Options and Tile Patterns and choose a different background. Birds. Uh, nothing happens. Oh, wait, wait. Choose the Fill tool, select Tile Fill, and click on the background. Select Tile Fill. Oh, now it works. I'll try a different one. Let's make a fancy frame. Oh, here we go. Not bad. Now, just to complete the picture... You know, computers are wonderful tools, but if they get into the wrong oh, hands... Oh, okay, okay. Of course, if you really want to knock their socks off, you could bring live video into your document. <laughs> And the one I want to uh, demonstrate right now is a magazine called Nautilus. And this is put out by Meditech. Uh, they actually use the um, Ace Metrics Toolbook as their authoring platform. There's a number of uh, very neat things about this title. Today's technology will enable me to uh, encapsulate almost any kind of information into a mail message. And as an example, here is a, uh, a video clip that's being attached to the mail message and which can be redistributed to anyone with using standard desktop technology anywhere in the world. The key phrase is anywhere in the world. And this is an example of a full motion video of a, of a windsurfer. Now that's my kind of memo. Well, what we're seeing here is really the merging of computers and television. The video toaster is actually a piece of hardware. Well, it's a circuit board in that terminology. It plugs or sits inside an Amiga computer. And when it's inside, the back portion here extends out the back of the computer so we can actually connect video sources to it and take video source out of it. Its primary uh, uses are to allow one to deal with, edit, and manipulate video material. So if you want to deal with, for example, video coming from videotape, or let's say from a camera, for example, and we want to manipulate that video, then we can use a toaster to do that. And then, of course, there's some software that goes on the computer uh, side of it. And it's made up of five distinct components that actually make up the toaster. The uh, switcher, for example, is one of the components of the toaster, and the switcher allows us to take two different video sources, or four, up to four, actually, and switch between them. Simply one signal changes places with the other one. Or we could use a special effect. For example, we might want to pour one video image into another. I've always found this one rather bizarre. This is called the sheep switch. By far the most complex of the pieces involved in the toaster is the 3D animation section. I'm going to grab a pre-done object. I'm going to move out to what's called the layout area. It's a wireframe, which means at this point it's not solid, so I can move my object in my world. I can also manipulate lights, and I can also manipulate the camera. I'm going to move it from the back corner to the front corner and create an animation of 30 frames. The first thing I'm going to tell it is I want to create what's called a key frame, and that key frame is the first frame. Then I'm going to move ahead 15 frames in my animation, and at Frame 15 of my animation, the object will actually be in the middle right here. Now we'll move to the final keyframe and it's done. Now the interesting part is I've only created actually three keys. So I said to the computer, at this point it's here, 15 points later it's here, 30 points later it's here. You figure out the in-betweens. So the toaster is actually made up of five separate components, but they're integrated into one box.
At the same time, its performance level is very high because of that. So all of those features built into one. It's kind of a neat device. Hmm. I could use that to produce training materials for my new employees. Oh, there's almost no end to what you could do. So this is what they call multimedia. Exactly. Multimedia in its infancy started out on videotape. Uh, the trouble with videotape is, of course, that it is a straight line medium. In other words, in order to get to the middle, you have to fast forward to the middle of the tape. To get around that, LaserDisc uh, was invented some 10 years ago. LaserDisc was simply a videotape transferred to a record type format and it allowed you random access. The CD-ROM, on the other hand, because of its versatility, its size, makes it a very popular medium for distributing information, and because many computers now have CD-ROM drives on them, it becomes a much more versatile media. Some of the things that we're looking at is a presentation put together by one of the large spreadsheet manufacturers promoting their spreadsheet product, and it shows you very quickly the integration of sound and graphics and animation. saves all data and graphs in the worksheet, as well as all formats, styles, and global settings. Or you can go any place in the movie by clicking on the slider. One of the things that is becoming very popular for young people is the CD-ROM or the multimedia storybook, where you can virtually create your own endings. Okay, I'll slip on the gloves and the helmet and... Hey, what the... Multimedia is still in its infancy as far as the CD-ROM is concerned, uh, but it is starting to find its use in business. Uh, first of all, primarily, I guess, in training. Another aspect now is in product promotion. Where it's going and where it's going to end up, nobody really knows. My own personal perception is that we could very well end up with the Starship Enterprise holodeck concept where you can actually participate rather than just view. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Animation, interactive video, multimedia, movies, voice input. What next? Where do we go from here? Hmm. That's a good question. In the future, we'll have to worry less about some of the keyboarding problems that people have had um, and more about perhaps laryngitis because you'll simply have voice, voice input. You won't even need to do any writing at all. You'll be able to talk to your computer. It will sit up and beg for you and do everything. The office will, it'll get so it's completely automated. What I want is to be able to say to the computer, bring me that letter that I wrote to old Jones uh, the month before last and have the computer do it. While there seems to be more and more technology all the time, there seem to be fewer and fewer people who really have an understanding of how it all works. More and more people will be working at home like me, and, and going to the office is not going to be an ordeal. It's a matter of going down the hall. As communications is, is be, become globalized, it, it really doesn't matter where anybody is. They're all essentially in the same room. In 10 years from now, memory will be free, the disk drive will be free. So capacity for applications, for, for large applications, uh, should be essentially infinite. The other thing I think that to me is probably the most fascinating is the computer will become an appliance. And that I find really fascinating because we will see the computer less and less become the computer sitting on your desk and more and more simply something that becomes part of everything else. I see it as the demise of the printing business. I, I think that's uh, in the cards for 
within the next 20 years as we know it. I would predict in the next 10 years that we will go right through the realm of virtual reality where you put on a helmet and you live in a different world and you can actually participate in events. You can, if you're learning how to scuba dive, you can actually put yourself into a scuba diving environment and swim under the ocean without ever getting wet. The technology will in fact facilitate the, the, the true democracy, the, the Greek style democracy, if we as a society choose to take that risk. They call this the second industrial revolution, but right now we are still in the foothills of the mountain range. And that mountain range may be the second industrial revolution, but we're still in the foothills of mountains at tops so we can't even begin to see yet. For Bits and Bites, I'm Billy Benn. And I'm Victoria Stoker. Who knows? See you in 10 years.